Welcome to the Chicago Bar Association's You and the Law. I'm Janine Cordero, a member of the Chicago Bar Association. Women fought for it, African Americans risked their lives for it. What was once a privilege for wealthy men in America is available to all, the vote, yet many people fail to do it. Here to discuss your voting rights and ability to access the polls are Ami Gandhi, Director of Voting Rights and Civic Empowerment at the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and Barry Taylor, Vice President for Civil Rights and Systematic Litigation at Equip for Equality. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So, Ami, why is it important to vote? You know, it's so important to vote as a simple way that each of us can be engaged in our communities. In this presidential year election, we're thinking about how we might be in a blue state or a red state or a purple state. And yes, that's important. The presidential election as a high profile incident is definitely important. But we also, each of us live in a state house district, in a state senate district, in a congressional district. And we can make a difference in each of those political races as well. And often in those elections, there is a smaller margin of a vote that makes a difference. So our individual vote, our community's vote, our family's vote can really make a difference in some of those local elections. And the elected officials in those districts really have a huge impact on our daily lives, on our schools, our roads, the police officers who work with us, all of those ways that affect our daily lives. So it's really important for us to give our opinion by choosing to support or oppose whichever candidates we like. And every vote, vote matters, so Absolutely. let's not be apathetic about getting out to the polls. Um, there is early voting going on right now, and also you can register to vote if you haven't done so already. So let's talk about some of the issues we're seeing at the polls. Um, your, your group focuses on uh, making sure that everybody can get to the polls and exercise their right to vote. Um, can, can you talk about some of the problems you're seeing in the community? Even in 2016, even in Illinois, an overall diverse and inclusive place, we still see challenges at the polls, particularly for communities of color, for other vulnerable populations who have historically been disenfranchised. Some of the issues we see include confusion about when and where we can register and when and where we can vote. People also still face voter intimidation at the polls, sometimes depending on our neighborhood or the political context of where we're voting. What's an example of voter intimidation? So in this last primary election in March of 2016, we heard many stories from community members who called us for help in the face of voter intimidation in their neighborhood poll. One example was a community member who was given a sample ballot by an election judge. So in other words, someone who works at the poll gave that voter suggestions about who to vote for mm -hmm. and who to vote against. You know, completely not allowed for mm -hmm. a person to be pressured to vote one way or another inside the polling place, especially by someone who is working at the polls and right. who is supposed to facilitate a voter making that choice mm -hmm. and not influencing a voter one way or another. And I do want to talk about the job that the voting judges do, what they're tasked with, but I'd like to ask Barry Taylor about um, another issue at the polls, which is accessibility for uh, people with disabilities. Why don't you talk about that? Sure, Janine. Well, people with disabilities really have been another group that's been disenfranchised historically in our country. And a lot of times it's because of the barriers that they face when they try to vote. Uh, although there are laws in place to address accessibility, there are still many polling places that aren't accessible. So if you're in a wheelchair, sometimes there's not accessible parking at the polling place or the path of travel to go from the parking lot into the building is not accessible because there are stairs or maybe there are holes or something and it's not a smooth surface. Then when you get to the door, sometimes the door is not wide enough to get in or it's too heavy to, to open or you can't open it if, if you have a, a closed fist, maybe if somebody with cerebral palsy. Uh, and then once you get into the polling place, there can be other physical barriers as well. So it's, there are a lot of barriers that have just prevented people from voting. And um, the statistics show that people with disabilities vote at a, about 6% less uh, rate than uh, non-disabled voters, which I think gives an indication that they've had a lot of barriers over the years. Mm. Um, one question I had was transportation. Um, if a person has no transportation to get to a polling place, is there a way they can call for uh, PACE or some uh, type of transportation to get them to the polls? 
Sure, they're, they're, if people are eligible for paratransit, they can have their ride take them to the polling place just like they would for any kind of other appointment that they have to go through. Unfortunately, sometimes the paratransit's not always reliable, but there have been efforts that have been made recently to try to make it uh, better for scheduling and to allow people to get there on time. But that's certainly a, an opportunity for folks to, to get to polling places. I want to mention, too, that in Illinois, all of us are also permitted to vote by mail. So this used to be called an absentee ballot, mm -hmm. and we felt like we had to give a special excuse or reason in order to access that type of ballot. But the law now says that any of us can vote by mail if we follow the procedural rules. If anyone has questions about how to get that type of ballot, by when they have to mail it in, those other kind of questions, they can feel free to call our nonpartisan voter protection hotline, 866-OUR-VOTE, which is open even right now and also will be open on election day, of course, and from now through the elections. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for all of our communities to know about that option to vote by mail. Um, early voting, as you mentioned, is already open. That may be a more convenient way for some of our community members mm -hmm. to have a little bit more time and space to right. get into the polling place um, and avoid the rush of election day. And if people are confused about where their polling place is or questions about voter registration, can they call that hotline Absolutely. As well? They can call that hotline. We welcome those questions. There are also some really great online tools available. ChicagoElections.com slash info has a good online tool available where people can put in an address and find out where their polling place is. And there are other tools like Hello Vote, which allows people to find out by text whether they're registered or not or get ideas. Some of us find it easier to get the information by text than any other mode of communication these days. And there are lots of great tools out there, but if it's information overload for anyone, if the legal and practical requirements feel complicated, I know they do for a lot of us, feel, anyone should feel free to call 866-OUR-VOTE, and we, we would be happy to look up whether the person is registered or where they should get that done. Great. Um, and going back to the um, disabled community, um, Barry, what, what protections do, does this community have? There are two major protections. One is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, and says that all state and local governments need to have their programs accessible, and specifically mentioned voting as something that has to be accessible to people with disabilities. But then another law was passed um, after the 2000 election, after the hanging chads we had in Gore versus Good, uh, Bush versus Gore. Um, one of the things they put into the, the law that was passed called the Help America Vote Act is that every polling place now has to have an electronic voting machine which will allow a person who's blind to vote independently and privately. And so that's a huge change. And it, when you put the Help America Voter Act with the ADA, which talks about meaningful access, we're now not just talking about people being able to be assisted to vote and people helping people to vote. Instead, it's about people being able to vote independently and privately. Because you know, who wants uh -huh. to share who you're voting with with a stranger? Everybody wants to be able to vote on their own and privately. And now, combining the Help America Vote Act and the ADA together, we can do that. That's great. And I want to mention, too, that some of those very types of tools can also be helpful for citizens who are not yet comfortable voting in English and mm. who can access translations or even audio ballots in a different language through these same electronic right. voting machines in Chicago and other parts of the state. That's great. Um, those are really important tools to enforce civil rights for citizens with limited English proficiency, mm -hmm. and we would encourage people to take advantage of those. In Chicago, just as an example, we have ballots available in Spanish, Chinese, and Hindi. And even in the suburbs, we increasingly see language access for That's our great. community members as well. And one thing that I think this points out is that disability access is also what's called universal design. And it helps not only people with disabilities, but others as well. So in addition to the, the instances that Ami mentioned, also if you have a ramp that helps somebody maybe who has a stroller or mm -hmm. somebody who um, is not comfortable with stairs even if they don't have a disability or in a right. wheelchair. And so access really promotes access for all. That's right. True. Um, let's go to the election judges because obviously if you uh, are new to the system or you would like to access that electronic voting machine that we've been discussing, you probably want to go to an election judge for assistance, ask for help. So let's talk about who are these people, do they get any training, uh, what can we expect from them when we go into the voting places? 
Election judges are trained by the election authority in that jurisdiction, whether it's the city of Chicago, suburban Cook County, or another county in Illinois. They sometimes receive a combination of online and in-person training, and we work very closely and proactively with the election boards to try to prevent as many problems and strengthen the training as much as we can before election day, in addition to our advocacy role during and after the elections. So while we really appreciate the role of the very hardworking election judges who are on the front lines of the voting process, we also know that with the rapidly changing demographics in our communities, as well as the evolutions in the law, even just in the last few days, we've seen some changes with regard to election day registration. Mm -hmm. And some of these procedures and laws will continue to change over time, even between now and the elections, which can make it a confusing landscape for a voter as well as someone working at the polls as an election judge. Mm -hmm. And so if any voters are confused about what their rights are, it's great for the voter to ask for help from the election judge, but also to keep our information handy of different advocacy organizations in case they need to call and get more assistance or information beyond what help they're getting from the election judge. And so we're happy to help if people call 866-OUR-VOTE. And we, w we really appreciate the work of the election judges. Many of them are there from very for very long hours. They now, typically they work. Paid? They're paid. Okay. And they typically work from the time the polls open at 6 a.m. until the time until That's after the polls day. close at 7 p.m. So it's mm -hmm. a very long day. And so we're happy to also be a partner in supplying information. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that we're increasingly seeing diversity in among election judges, not now, just. Now, do they have to have Republican and Democratic judges? you know, in a polling place, they can't all be Democrats or Republicans. Yes, that's okay. right. So we definitely see political diversity. We're increasingly seeing racial and language diversity among the workforce of people who are working at the polls at election as election judges. We also are seeing a lot of young people working at the polls through programs where high school students and college students can become election judges. And we would definitely encourage more and more young people to apply to be part of that workforce. They're often very on top of the current requirements with regard to voting and really eager to learn what the, what the training information is and let us all know how we can vote. Well, and I know Barry uh, Equip for Equality has a very interesting new program where they're partnering with the city of Chicago. Why don't you tell us about that to help people with, get to the polls with disabilities? Sure, so unfortunately because of um, our old architecture here in, in Chicago, a lot of the places that have been chosen for polling places aren't physically accessible. And while the city has made some efforts over the years, it really is continuing to be a problem. And so the city has decided to launch a, a new initiative in conjunction with Equip for Quality where we're going to survey every single polling place. We're going to go to over 1,700 polling places on election day and make sh and identify what barriers exist. And we want to go on election day because oftentimes this, the situation doesn't exist on different days and you want to go when mm -hmm. people are actually voting to find out it, is the door open and, and how they're handling it on that specific day. And so we'll be going out conducting these surveys and then we'll be giving all that information back to the Chicago Bar Board of Elections. And then the, the commitment that the city has made is that by the next major election, which will be March 2018, the primary, all of these uh, polling places will now be accessible. And this is something that we've been wanting for a long time. And I think by putting all our resources together for this particular election, we're gonna make it happen. That's great. And uh, across the country, this is a problem in many uh, areas, right? The Department of Justice has had to investigate um, they have. other, other uh, they have. cities. They, they've done an initiative in conjunction with the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's offices. And so the U.S. Attorney's office here in Chicago went out to some polling places uh, during the primary and identified a lot of barriers. What's great though is that the city of Chicago said, okay, we agree, these barriers are here and we wanna do what we need to do to fix it. Other cities have said, if you think we're bad, sue us. And I just think the attitude that the Chicago Board of Elections has taken is fantastic and is one that will result in the systemic change we want, but in a collaborative fashion as opposed to an adversarial one. And it's people who would like to volunteer for that program can sign up. Do you want to talk about how they sure. can do that? We're going to be having training sessions throughout October. One we're going to have at our office at Equip for Quality on October 26th at uh, 930. But a lot of the, our partner law firms are doing trainings, McDermott and 
Neil Gerber, Kirkland, Winston Strawn. So people, if they want to sign up for the training and get more information, can call 312-895-7223, or they can email us at votingaccesschicago at equipforequality.org. Great. And you were going to make a point on me? I was going to mention, too, that the you're completely right that the Department of Justice and other government authorities will be there as a watchdog on Election Day to make sure everything is going as it should. And then we, as community organizations, also have an important role to play. Um, we can seek credentials as nonpartisan civic organizations so that we can be out at the polls monitoring the situation, whether it's measuring accessibility, observing election judges, all of the above. And so volunteers who partner with Chicago Lawyers Committee can be a part of, on one hand, answering the hotline calls to 866 our vote and giving legal information to voters who have questions. But also we have numerous volunteers who will be out in the field, actually in the polling place, watching and often negotiating and advocating to election judges to solve the problems immediately at the time that they happen on election day. And so we welcome the participation and partnership from attorneys. We're really proud to be partnering with Chicago Bar Association and Chicago Bar Foundation on this nonpartisan voter protection training that we call election protection. And we will have CLEs available for that training on October 25th and 27th, as well as November 2nd and 3rd. We have daytime options and evening options for the trainings. And we're really happy to continue to add to the list of law firms and community organizations who are partnering with us to make sure that everything's going as it should be on election day. And in the instance that it's not, to make sure to resolve those problems as soon as possible so that everyone has the full and fair right to vote. Great. Uh, Barry, what, ha what happens? What should somebody do if they end up going to their polling place and they're, they can't get in or the electronic machine isn't working properly? What should they do? Well, we do have a voter helpline on election day that people can call and they should feel free to call us about barriers that they face, but also if they have questions like about their polling place, just as Ami talked about, they can call us at 1-800-537-2632 and there'll be uh, an attorney available to answer any questions they have, and if there's a barrier that uh, can be fixed um, and they, that they um, need that needs fixing, we can work with the election authority to have them go out immediately to address the problem. And then for those barriers that are problematic that don't get fixed, we'll definitely be following up on those afterwards with the election authority. Great. And let's talk a minute about voter registration. Um, you brought a sample form. What do you need? What things do you need to bring with you to register to vote? You need an ID of some sort or tell us about that. Yeah, I want everyone to know that the voter registration form is a lot shorter than we might think that it is. And so there are just a few fields that voters have to fill out um, as long as they're eligible to vote above the age of 18 and a U.S. citizen. And the few other fields that people have to fill out, usually people can do so pretty quickly. And if it's the first time that they're registering, there may be some ID requirements initially, although there are many different types of identification that a person can bring in in order to vote. Um, voter registration can be done online and or in person or by mail. There are a lot of different options in Illinois. We're lucky to be in an environment where there are increasing registration options. And where can uh, a person get these forms other than online? Are they available? <coughs> excuse me, at libraries or places like that? Yes, exactly. The voter registration forms are available in many different sites, um, especially in downtown Chicago, as well as other offices that the election boards have, libraries, community organizations. Um, many times there are voter registration drives happening in people's own neighborhoods and communities. And mm -hmm. so if anyone is interested in having forms at, at their community event or partnering with people who are called registrars who are permitted to register people to vote right then and there on the spot. People should definitely feel free to contact Chicago Lawyers Committee, call our hotline, or visit votingrightsillinois.org, whatever way is most convenient for people to um, help their own community and family members register to vote. And let's uh, hold the ballot up, um, and we'll have uh, show these in, in full context, but uh, it's, it's quite a sample a, ballot. It's, it's, it's a sample ballot, and it's, you can see it's pretty long. Um, you're going to have a pen that you're going to draw across the arrow for the person of your choice. Um, and then there's a backside, no? Just for a few things, yeah. 
So um, you're right. This, Sometimes the ballot is very long because there are many different local offices yes. that are up for election right. this year. And I want to also alert um, the public to uh, the. Um, this is a we call it a vote smart guide here at the Chicago Bar Association. Um, and basically, this year uh, there are many judges up for retention as well as election. And the Chicago Bar Association Judicial Evaluation Committee. Uh, goes through a very thorough process where all of these judges are reviewed, there's a thorough investigation on each judge, and then basically the CBA comes out with their recommendations of who is qualified and who, or recommended and who is not recommended. And we do have a few people here who we're not recommending. And um, I encourage voters to print this out from the Chicago Bar Association website, which is um, chicagobar.org. And it's in the, you can scroll down to the left and there's um, information for the public and they can go there and print this out. Uh, and I wanna talk a minute about what we can take into the polls with us. What are those rules? Because I think that's very confusing to a lot of people. But you can print this out and take it into the poll so when you are voting, um, filling out your ballot, you know who to vote for and who not to vote for. Uh, so, um, and judges, I wanna, make a plug, are very important people in our communities, uh, both in criminal and civil courts. They make decisions that affect our daily lives in very uh, profound ways. And so we really do want the best and the brightest judges on the bench serving our, our people. So uh, let's talk about what you can bring. So for example, if I were a disabled person and I wanted somebody to assist me to go into the polls, is that permitted, Barry? Absolutely. Um, there's only restrictions is you can't have your employer or a union representative go in with you. And so you can bring anybody you want. You can even bring a child, so it doesn't have to be somebody who's 18 to assist you. And of course, if somebody comes in and they don't have somebody to assist them, uh, election judges can assist them. And they would just need to have one from each party to go and do that uh, process. So there's really no reason somebody can't vote because you can get assistance either by somebody who you know or somebody who will be at the polling place. That's a really important right that you mentioned that we all have, including people who may have a language barrier and may need assistance for that reason. Um, so any of us can bring a friend or family member with us to help us vote, as you mentioned. And we can also bring material in with us, Janine, as you mentioned, if it helps us to make our decision about who to vote for, especially for some of the judicial offices and others where we may not have it memorized off the top of our head um, what issues a, a person, a candidate stands for and who we might want to support or oppose. And we, while we are allowed to bring in that information with us and use it while we're voting privately, all of us also have the right to be safe from political pressure at the polls. And so electioneering is not allowed in the polling place or right outside of the entrance. And so we should all feel comfortable to make our choice for who we're voting for and not feel pressured by election judges, by campaign workers or by candidates inside the polling place. That's something that's that kind of persuasion or intimidation is not allowed. And so um, if anyone d is feeling uncomfortable by being pressured to vote for or against a particular candidate in the polling place, they should make sure to report that to their election judge or call 866-OUR-VOTE. We would just want to make sure that everyone has the right to vote for the person who they truly support. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, what is at stake in this election aside from the presidential race? Are there other important issues on the ballot that people need to focus on or should focus on? A lot of eyes are also on the U.S. Senate races, and so control of the Senate could potentially change during this election. Um, we do have a Senate race happening here in Illinois, and so while we're a nonpartisan organization, we fully support and, and encourage community members to choose the candidate of his or her choice for the Senate race, as well as all of the local races for Illinois House districts and Senate districts and other local offices, whether it's water reclamation district, judicial offices, as you mentioned. I never know who to choose for water reclamation. <laughs> you have to read the paper and really get down into, you know, reading the synopsis for each of the, each person, but yeah, that's. Yeah, I think that you're right, and there are increasingly a lot of voter guides available for people to get educated about the issues that might matter to them. Um, I know that one of the community organizations 
uh, community organizations, Chicago Votes, that works with a lot of youth of color, has put out a candidate guide informing people of who the candidates are and what the issues are and what the policy stances are on different issues. And so people should definitely take advantage of those types of materials before they decide who to vote for. Absolutely. And um, Barry, does it ever happen if a person can't, a disabled person cannot get into their polling place, are they ever permitted to go to a, po a different polling place where it is accessible, where it may have a ramp or an elevator or in some way be much more convenient for them? Well, there are a couple options. One is if you have an inaccessible place, uh, your, your home polling place, you, one thing to do is do early voting because those are all supposed to be 100% accessible. And so that's an option for folks. But the other thing is Illinois does have a law called curbside voting. And what that means is that the election judges will come out to you with a portable uh, polling booth. And again, you have to have two election judges come out to do that. And so you're supposed to call the day before and let people know that you're gonna need that assistance. However, most election judges are, you know, if they're um, alerted that somebody can't get in because somebody may not call because they don't know they have their right or they don't know their polling place is inaccessible, I've never heard of a situation where people, election judges have refused to come out when somebody says, I can't get in the place. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that really is, you know, it's the solution for now. We're hoping this is the last time curbside voting will have to happen and that we'll have 100% accessibility in 2018. But for this election, curbside voting is an option that people can exercise. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. We're out of time, but I think we got a lot of great information out to the public and Equip for Equality is doing this exciting partnering with uh, the city of Chicago um, proactively, which is wonderful, and your organization is making sure people of color and other dis disenfranchised communities uh, can also access the polls. So we're hoping it'll be better next election 2018, but we're all looking for at least some progress this election as well. So every vote matters. Get out and vote. I'm Janine Cordero for You and the Law. Thank you for watching.